So we're just going to wait a couple of minutes for um, everybody to join in. So thank you to those of you who are here now. All right, well, it looks like some people are still joining us, but I wanted to welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Emily Renault, and I am Nanomet's Marketing and Digital Content Manager. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited about uh, the discussion that we're going to kick off here in a moment, um, which will be led by Dr. Marissa McMahon, who is our Director of Fisheries here at Nanomet. And she'll be telling us all about um, the ways in which we're studying black sea bass in their newly expanded habitat in the Gulf of Maine in order to understand its ecological impacts and uh, as well as how we can support the development of a black sea bass fishery here in the Gulf of Maine. So if you're new to Manomet, um, welcome again. Uh, so for over 50 years, Manomet has been a leader in conservation and environmental education and outreach. We use science and collaboration to strengthen flyways, coastal ecosystems, and working lands and seas across the Western Hemisphere. And we do this work with many, many partners uh, to help nature and local communities thrive. So just real quick, um, some housekeeping things. Um, at the bottom of your, Zoom, uh, of your Zoom screen, you should see a box that's marked Q&A. If you don't see it, just use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom of your screen and it should pop up. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, uh, feel free to click on that Q&A box and go ahead and enter your question and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can throughout the presentation and we'll try to build in a little bit of time at the end to answer any that we weren't able to get to. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded and we're going to send a follow-up email to all participants with a link to the recording uh, within the next day or so. And finally, I just want to extend a special thank you to the sponsors of our fall webinar series, uh, Hemingway and Barnes and Howling Capital. Um, we very much appreciate their support for our online educational opportunities, including this webinar. And so now I'm going to uh, turn things over to Marissa. So Marissa, please take it away. Great, thank you so much, Emily, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about black sea bass, um, which is a species that I've actually been studying for the better part of a decade. Um, I am gonna turn my video off um, just for the presentation. My internet has been a little uh, wonky since we had a power outage here after that storm. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna start with just some broad background about warming temperatures and species distribution. Um, so what we've really seen as temperatures have warmed globally is that it's really no longer safe to assume that a species historic range reflects its current range. And that's because species are moving to avoid thermal stress. So in general, these are poleward movements, essentially species moving in the direction that reduces thermal stress. And we've now seen this in thousands of examples uh, across the world in aquatic, marine, and terrestrial species. So one noteworthy species in particular that has undergone a rapid shift in distribution is the black sea bass. This has really been the poster child of marine species on the move. And so I wanna start with just a little bit of background on this species. 
So black sea bass are temperate reef fish. So like many reef fish, they like structured bottom. So anywhere that's rocky or reef-like, including artificial structure like shipwrecks, wind platforms, piers, uh, any place that has sort of kelp forest or any sort of structure like that. There are also what we call protogenous hermaphrodites, which means that they're typically born female and then transition to male later in life. They support important and lucrative commercial and recreational fisheries, as well as subsistence fisheries. Um, and they are unfortunately what we refer to as a data poor species, meaning that there are critical gaps in our understanding of the ecology and biology of this species that leads to a degree of uncertainty in how we manage them. And there'll be more to come on that later. So, there are three stocks or management units of black sea bass in the US, the Gulf of Mexico stock, the South Atlantic stock, which ranges from Florida to Cape Hatteras, and the North Atlantic stock, which ranges from Cape Hatteras to the Gulf of Maine. So today our focus will be entirely on this Northern stock. So if we take a closer look at the northern stock, we can see how the range has shifted over time. So this first image on the left is looking at the center of stock biomass or where black sea bass are most abundant in the 1970s. So those dark green areas are where the highest abundance of sea bass is occurring. And so we actually see that they're predominantly in the 1970s, predominantly off of North Carolina and the Chesapeake Bay area. And then on the right hand side, we're looking at the center of stock biomass in the 2010s, which has shifted north to New York and Rhode Island. So just a sort of a visual of how the, the range of this species has shifted over time. Now, I want to just slightly pivot here and talk a little bit more in detail about the Gulf of Maine and what's going on here specifically. So the Gulf of Maine is the body of water bordered by Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and Nova Scotia. And it historically was one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. But today we're actually seeing the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. So this figure is showing recent warming trends and projected warming trends in the Gulf of Maine. And most important to note here is the recent acceleration of warming shown by the steep red trend line uh, that is pointed to uh, right here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, also the projected continued warming that we're expecting to see in the Gulf of Maine. This warming is really wreaking havoc on the Gulf of Maine ecosystem. And so this is actually a figure from a 2019 story by a journalist named Colin Woodard. And it basically is breaking down all of the various ecosystem impacts that we're experiencing in the Gulf of Maine. And I won't go through the entire figure, but just in a nutshell, we're seeing cold water species moving north out of the Gulf of Maine or deeper to avoid warm water. So species like Atlantic cod and the American lobster. And we're seeing new warm water species moving in. So things like squid and blue crabs and black sea bass that we didn't used to have in the Gulf of Maine. But digging a little deeper, we're also seeing many native species declining or just disappearing. Um, things like northern shrimp, which were once supported a very important fishery in the Gulf of Maine. We're also unfortunately seeing many invasive species like the green crab thriving in these warming waters. And ultimately all of these changes are greatly altering food webs in the Gulf of Maine. So let's take a closer look at black sea bass in the Gulf of Maine. And to do this, I'm gonna tell you a short story about my own background. Um, so I'm from a small fishing community in Maine called Georgetown, which is uh, where the star on this map is. And I grew up here fishing with my family who have been fishing in Georgetown since the early 1700s. Um, and so historically, we didn't see black sea bass in the Gulf of Maine. This blue circle here is really the northernmost extent of the historic range of black sea bass. They really weren't found north of Cape Cod. Uh, 
But in 2012, the Gulf of Maine experienced a warm water temperature anomaly, meaning temperatures were much higher than average. And it just so happened that I spent that summer of 2012 working on my dad's lobster boat. And a very strange thing started to occur in that summer. We started to see the, this fish in our lobster traps that I had never seen before. Um, and it turns out that these were black sea bass. And at the time, my dad had probably only ever caught two to three of these fish in his traps in 40 plus years of lobster fishing. But that summer we caught 30 or 40 sea bass in a single season. And it was the same everywhere. So all up and down the coast, people were reporting the same thing. So it was a very impactful uh, occurrence and, and really rapidly, um, you know, uh, uh, um, really rapidly, ex it was an example of how this warming water was shifting species distribution. Um, so black sea bass essentially extended their range from Cape Cod to mid-coast Maine in that 2012 summer and have basically been present in the Gulf of Maine ever since. So I always also like to stop here and point out that without the observations of fishers, we, meaning scientists and managers, wouldn't have known this was happening. So fishers were really on the front lines of this immense and rapid change. And it was their observations that sort of clued us in to, to what was happening and how rapid this range expansion was occurring. So what's the big deal? Uh, Black sea bass are in this new area. What does that mean? Well, the first thing to consider is ecological impacts of this new species. And the biggest ecological impacts come in the form of food web interactions. So really quickly, I'm gonna use this diagram of the Gulf of Maine food web to explain what I mean. So don't get too wrapped up in looking at all of the arrows and tiny text here. I'm just gonna walk you through this. So this left-hand side is looking at the Gulf of Maine food web with low human impacts. So essentially before, pre, uh, or before um, industrial fishing occurred. So the food web we see is dominated by large bodied ground fish like cod and haddock. And those fish exert predatory pressure on things like lobsters and crabs and sea urchins. Now, if we look at the right hand side, this is the food web with heavy human impacts where we have greatly reduced these large fish predators. So essentially in the past century or so, when we've seen really heavy fishing pressure on ground fish, things like cod and haddock again, we've seen a reduction in those fish predators and that's really releasing things like lobsters from predatory control. But with the emergence of black sea bass, we're now adding a new fish predator to this system. So, this is where we see ecological impacts potentially leading to socioeconomic impacts. The lobster fishery is the most important fishery in the Gulf of Maine. It accounts for 79% of the value of commercial species in Maine, which is shown here in this pie chart on the left. But it's also the second most valuable fishery in the US, uh, shown in this diagram on the right. So anything impacting the health of this fishery is going to have far reaching socioeconomic impacts. So we've been working to understand these impacts on multiple fronts. The first thing we've been doing is looking at black, uh, back, excuse me, tongue tied, <laughs> black sea bass diet. Um, so collecting fish samples and dissecting their stomachs to figure out what they're eating. And we've done this on a regional scale, collecting fish in southern Massachusetts, which is within the historical range of black sea bass, and in two areas in the Gulf of Maine, northern Massachusetts and mid-coast Maine. So this figure is looking at these three regions, each in a different color. So we have southern mass in red, northern mass in gray, and Maine in blue. Um, and then looking at the most important prey items in the diet, so um, essentially the table that I have here on the left is breaking down the trends that we see in the graph. So we actually see that black sea bass in Southern Massachusetts eat a lot of fish and squid. So 59% of the diet is fish and squid. And then we see that 
fish and squid become less important as we move north. So in northern mass, black sea bass eat some fish and squid, about 24% of the diet. And that it essentially, uh, excuse me, and that in Maine, um, sea bass eat almost no fish and squid. And it's essentially because the species uh, that they're eating, these, these fish and squid species they're eating, are really not very abundant in the Gulf of Maine. So they're shifting their diet to what is abundant. And what we have a lot of in the Gulf of Maine is crustaceans, so things like lobsters and crabs and shrimp. So we can actually see how the importance of crustaceans changes over this region, where in southern mass, 31% of the diet of sea bass is made up of crustaceans. In northern mass, 69% is made up of crustaceans. And in Maine, 78% of the diet of black sea bass is made up of crustaceans. Again, things like native crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. So from this, we know that they're eating lobsters. But we want to go one step further and see if there might be additional impacts of this new predator. And so we did predator prey experiments looking at non consumptive predation effects. So here's what I mean by that consumptive predation is exactly what it sounds like, where a predator consumes a prey species. So the example here being a lion eating a zebra. But non consumptive predation effects are indirect. So for instance, the mere presence of this lion can cause the entire herd of zebra to shift their movement behavior out of fear. So non-consumptive effects like this often have greater impacts on populations than the more simple removal of a single individual from consumptive predation. So we wanted to test this with sea bass and lobster. So can the mere presence of black sea bass impact lobster behavior? And the short answer is yes. We tested this on multiple levels and in multiple populations and looking at multiple behaviors. This figure is just one glimpse, but shows the amount of time lobsters spent inside and outside of shelter in the presence and absence of black sea bass. And these were lobsters from Massachusetts, which is the group on the left, and from Maine, which is the group on the right. So when sea bass are present, and it was really just the cue that the lobsters were given. Um, so they were just given a scent cue of sea bass in the water. They couldn't actually see them. So when that cue of sea bass is present, the lobsters essentially run and hide. They spend more time in shelter, they forage less, and they eat less, which has potentially huge implications for growth and reproduction of the lobster population. So circling back, to these ecological impacts leading to socioeconomic impacts, we know that sea bass are both consuming lobsters in the Gulf of Maine and influencing the population indirectly through these non-consumptive predation effects, which could have far-reaching economic and social impacts in this industry. But at the same time, Black sea bass support lucrative commercial and recreational fisheries in their native range and also contribute to subsistence fisheries. So is this actually an opportunity for the Gulf of Maine? So we actually surveyed lobster fishers in the Gulf of Maine to see what they thought. Um, and when asked what the overall impact of sea bass becoming more abundant in the Gulf of Maine would be, 57% actually said that it would be beneficial or very beneficial. And we had 21.5% saying that it would be both beneficial and harmful. And then another 21.5% that thought it would be harmful or very harmful. So overall, what we found is that there is a general optimism for this potential new fishery in the Gulf of Maine, and that the idea of it being a new opportunity sort of outweighs the fear of this being a real threat to the lobster industry. So I want to quickly segue into management. Um, because black sea bass move between state and federal waters, they're jointly managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is a deliberative body of the Atlantic coastal states that manages 27 interstate nearshore fisheries and the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. This is one of eight regional fishery management councils within US federal waters. And the federal waters uh, in, in the United States extend out 200 miles from shore. 
So these groups determine overall quota for commercial and recreational fisheries, which is then divided, Black Sea Bass fisheries in particular, which is then divided among the states. And then the states are responsible for setting specific management measures, such as minimum size limits, gear requirements, and fishing seasons. But drawing your attention back to this geographic area of the Northern Stock, um, currently the data used for management of this stock comes from within that historical range. So within that Cape Hatteras to Cape Cod historical range of sea bass, that's where all of the data currently used in the, in the management um, system comes from. So we are essentially now managing a species and developing fisheries for a species in an area where we really know nothing about it. And there has historically essentially not been any data on black sea bass in the Gulf of Maine. So a large part of what Manama is doing is collecting this data and then feeding it into the management process. So we are currently participating in the 2022 stock assessment for black sea bass, which will incorporate data on sea bass from the Gulf of Maine for the first time. Excitingly, this is also one of the first species stock assessments in history that is gathering observations and local ecological knowledge from sea bass fishers that will inform the assessment and build research recommendations going forward. So uh, in sort of wrapping up, I wanna take a step back and think about the bigger picture for a minute. The Gulf of Maine was once home to diverse and abundant fisheries resources. This is sort of a snapshot of what fisheries looked like 50 to 100 years ago. We had many different species supporting many different fisheries, which is really what we need if we want resilient fisheries and coastal communities. But if we look at fisheries in the Gulf of Maine today, we see a very different picture where it's really just these two species holding everything together. Lobsters account for almost 80% of Maine's fisheries value and scallop and lobsters combined account for 80% of Massachusetts fisheries value. So this is not a good situation to be in. This is having essentially all of your eggs in one basket. And of course, uh, going back to earlier, we know that we're also at the same time experiencing immense environmental change. So we need to get back to a place where we have diversity like we had 50 to 100 years ago. And I think we can get there, but I don't think it will necessarily look the same. Some of the species will be the same, but some will be different. And black sea bass will be a part of that. So Manomet's fisheries work is really focused on building resilient fisheries and coastal communities. And we're approaching that work in many ways, such as the work on an emerging new species like black sea bass, as you saw today. Black sea bass is just one of many species moving north into the Gulf of Maine. Others include squid, scup, blue crabs, butterfish, triggerfish, just to name a few. Um, we're also working on restoring and rebuilding native populations and habitats, such as river herring, softshell clams, and oyster reefs. We're exploring fishery opportunities for invasive species like green crabs and other underutilized species like Jonah crabs. And we're working to understand how aquaculture can be utilized as a diversification strategy. So it's really about a wide array of approaches to this goal of building resilience and building back diversity like we had 50 to 100 years ago. So I want to quickly acknowledge that a lot of this black sea bass work that I showed was conducted at Northeastern University and our ongoing work is being done in partnership with them. So just to acknowledge uh, that, that partnership. And also this work has been funded primarily by the NOAA Salt and Stahl Kennedy Grant Program as well as the National Sea Grant Program. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take questions if folks have them. Well, thank you so much, Marissa. That was an awesome uh, look into how black sea bass are impacting the Gulf of Maine. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat and um, Marissa will be happy to answer them.
Um, I'm curious, Marissa, have you ever tried black sea bass if we're developing a fishery for them? Do you know, um, are they tasty? <laughs> I have. I've tried a lot of them, actually. That was one of the perks of doing so many experiments with them. <laughs> uh, there was always a lot of black sea bass on hand afterwards. So yeah, they're delicious. They're like a very flaky, delicate white fish that white fleshed fish that is, uh, you know, absolutely delicious. And it's, you know, fairly common thing to see on restaurant menus in the mid-Atlantic, which is sort of within that historical range. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity to see it on the menu more up here. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We got a couple more questions that have come in now. Um, George asks, when do you expect new guidelines for the black sea bass fishery? Um, yeah. So right now it's a, a little over a year long process that we're in for the, the current research track stock assessment. So we're scheduled to have that wrapped up. Oh, I'm trying to think of the timeline. I think we're, we're scheduled to have that wrapped up in September of 2022. And then it goes through a process of review. So we'll send out that assessment for review and then a decision is made on whether or not to accept the, the current assessment. And if it's accepted, then it moves forward to the management body to, to actually put that into action. So probably it would be, I would imagine in early 2023. Um, all right, Louise asks a two-part question. Um, she says, acceptance of a new species is often hard to establish. Can you talk a little bit about um, what it was like persuading fishers? Um, yeah, so I, I would say, um, yeah, I can sort of answer that in two different parts as well. So Within the Gulf of Maine, um, there's really, there hasn't been a shift in quota that has allowed Gulf of Maine fishers to really target black sea bass yet. And so that's sort of the where, you know, the direction that we're moving in. Um, and so right now, you know, we see that, you know, fishers in Massachusetts, for instance, lobster fishers are catching a lot as bycatch. And so they see it a lot. They're you know, seeing it in their traps. It's, it's almost becoming a bit of a nuisance because they're catching so much as bycatch. Um, and, but so they're also, you know, it, it's, they're seeing that and they're sort of seeing missed opportunities. Um, and so I think that because of that, because they have this sort of interaction already with the species and, and they can see sort of, um, you know, the, the potential that's there just in the abundance that they're seeing. I think it doesn't take a whole lot of persuading. I think it's more, you know, figuring out how we can manage this particular species more adaptively and have sort of more flexibility in, in distributing quota. Um, you know, from my conversations with fishers in Massachusetts, it seems like they would eagerly participate in the black sea bass fishery uh, if they were able to. Um, and then, so then the other part I would say, um, so we also have worked with fishers in Rhode Island and the interesting thing that we've seen there, Rhode Island used to have a very lucrative lobster fishery that collapsed, of course, in the early 2000s. And black sea bass was one of the species that those fishers were able to sort of pivot to. And so it was really important in terms of you know, allowing fishers to continue to thrive and to continue to have resources to target. Um, you know, the collapse of the lobster fishery led to fishers targeting sea bass and squid and whelks and scup and all sorts of different species that they didn't target before um, and probably would never have imagined that they would have targeted, but it was sort of out of necessity that that happened because they lost their primary resource. Right. Oh, and sorry, there was another part about, um, cons was it about public? Yeah, oh. she also asks, um, I know you mentioned this a little bit already, kind of alluding to how some restaurants are adding them onto menus, but yeah, what do you, what do you think the public's um, response is going to be um, as this fishery becomes more established? I, I don't envision that it will be very difficult to persuade people, uh, particularly because black sea bass is a species that you know, there's lucrative recreational and commercial fisheries that already exist. And so it's not a brand new species necessarily. It's something that, you know, people in this country are used to seeing in, in certain areas. And so 
Yeah, I don't necessarily think that it will be um, difficult to persuade folks, um, but I think a lot of it is often just outreach and education and just sort of getting the word out there and, you know, kind of broadening the horizons for folks who, you know, might not necessarily see black sea bass as something that they want on their dinner plate, but just sort of, you know, understanding that part of how we get to diversified fisheries is through diversified consumption of, of fish. So, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Keeping an open mind. Um, <laughs> all right. Someone asks, how are black sea bass managed currently in New England? How are stock assessments conducted and do they incorporate any other ecological data into the management decisions? Yeah. So um, management in New England uh, is still undertaken by that sort of joint um, collaborative approach with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council. Um, interestingly, this is an example of a species, again, because it shifted so rapidly. There's, there's the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council and there's the New England Fisheries Council. And, um, you know, there's sort of a little bit of tension there now in terms of, you know, which, which of those bodies should have a seat at the table and should they both and, uh, you know, so there's definitely some shifting happening on that front in terms of, you know, how we might see the, the management of the species sort of shared amongst different um, fisheries councils in the future. Um, so, you know, essentially the process of, of, of management starts with the stock assessment. The stock assessment basically collects data, all, you know, the existing data that there is on black sea bass. And that comes from both fisheries data like landings, uh, you know, any sort of recreational fishing data that are good. Oh, Marissa, you're breaking up just a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Might need to turn off your video. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, now we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, so essentially, I, I'm not sure where I cut out, I apologize, but essentially the, the process is to, you know, conduct the stock assessment, which gathers all different types of data on the species, and then build a model, essentially, that, that then, you know, is peer-reviewed, so a little committee that peer reviews the science that was um, used to, to build the, the model for the species. And then they decide whether or not it's acceptable and then it gets passed on to the management bodies, which again, in this case, are the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Council. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Oh, you're, you're breaking up a little bit again, Marissa. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, considered and incorporated. So, so yeah, there's just sort of a wide range of. See, you froze. <laughs> oh no! Um, all right, we seem to be having some technical issues here. Um, so. Yeah, to the to the person who asked that question, hopefully you were able to hear most of Marissa's answer. Um, but if not, um, we can we can have her try to respond to your question in an email after. Um, if you prefer, Marissa, can you hear us? Okay, I can hear you. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, um, up in the Northeast, I don't know where everyone is joining us from, but we had a, a major storm come through yesterday. And so we're still dealing with um, some power outages and some internet issues here. So appreciate everybody's patience. Um, so we have another question here um, asks, what will be the economic implications for the fishers to switch from lobstering to fishing for sea bass, such as a change of equipment? And will it be seasonable? 
Yes, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that is, I think, so enticing about this potential new fishery is that it could potentially use a lot of the same gear, or at least gear that is very similar to what um, you know lobster fishers are already using. So sea bass are caught um, both in trawl fisheries and trap fisheries. Um, but certainly, you know, for lobster fishers, adapting to, you know, a, a, a sea bass trap fishery would be something that would be really approachable. Um, you know, very similar in terms of how lobsters are caught, where you set baited traps and then you, you know, periodically go back and check them. Um, so that I think is, is a very, um, you know, approachable fishery uh, in terms of, of gear being very similar and also, you know, perhaps a lower sort of um, barrier to entry. Um, and then, yes, so sea bass, it depends. It's sort of state by state in terms of um, the season in which you can, can catch them. Um, sea bass are a species that migrates. So you tend to see sea bass inshore in sort of the spring, summer, and fall, and then they migrate actually all the way off the continental shelf. Um, so pretty, uh, you know, long distance migration um, in terms of, uh, of fish species. And so in the winter, they're off the continental shelf, and that is where the fishery would operate. Um, but I would see in the Gulf of Maine, most likely, you know, the fishery would be more in that sort of season when the fish are in their near shore habitat. So spring, summer, fall. Great. Um, excellent. Well, does anybody else have any other questions for Marissa? Um, if so, please feel free to go ahead and drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, but Marissa, is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Again, apologies for the, the spotty internet connection there, but, um, oh, it looks like. Oh yes, so George asks, why do they migrate offshore in the winter? That's a, another great question. Uh, so it's typically driven by temperature. So they're sort of, you know, looking for that temperature cue in the fall when the temperature drops to a, a certain, um, a, a certain level, then they will, that's sort of their cue to move offshore and to move off of the continental shelf where temperature tends to be a little bit more mild. Um, and so that's where they'll spend the winter. And then again, uh, as, as far as we know, uh, and what we can tell from tagging studies, it's again, sort of a temperature cue that is triggering that near shore onshore migration in the spring. Very cool. All right. Well, if anybody has any additional questions, um, you can certainly feel free to reach out um, to Marissa. I'm sure she'd be happy to talk a little bit more about Black Sea Bass and some of the work that um, she and her team are doing. Um, but if that's all everybody has, um, I just wanted to thank you again, Marissa, for leading this discussion. It was so interesting to learn more about the ecology of black sea bass and some of the work that you and uh, your partners are doing to try and develop uh, black sea bass fishery in the Gulf of Maine. And hopefully we all see more black sea bass on our restaurant menus and in our grocery stores moving forward. I'm excited to try some. <laughs> well, um, thank and, you so much. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you everybody for participating today and for bringing your um, excellent questions and being part of our conversation here. Um, and I know that many of you are already supporters of Manomet, um, for which I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, and if you are interested in supporting the work that Marissa is doing or the work of any of our other science staff, um, you uh, um, please feel free to consider um, making a donation to Manomet. Um, I just dropped a link in the chat uh, if, if that's something that you would like to do. Um, and again, this webinar has been recorded and will be distributed in a follow-up email within the next 48 hours. Um, so please feel free to share that uh, recording with anybody that you think might be interested. And thank you again for joining, and I hope that everybody enjoys the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>